Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message series titled, You Can Overcome Your Obstacles by Pastor John Clark. This is part three. If you got your Bibles, I'm going to be in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, really for most of the message. But I want to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. Uh, that was critical um, to, to where we're at. And if you're, and if you're not familiar with what we've been doing. We started a series called You Can Overcome Your Obstacles, and we're on part three today. And we've been talking about the life of David, but we're talking about the, the, the life of David from the point where he was anointed to be king and for the next 22 years until he actually got the crown. And, and for a lot of us, we were surprised to understand it here that when David was anointed to be the next king of Israel, he has to wait 22 years before he gets it. 22 years he has to, to deal with things as God is beginning to chip off parts and edges and pieces of his life to get him to where he needs to be. And so we're going to talk about that. Now, in the midst of those 22 years, we're going to talk about moments that most of us have never even read about. I'm going to identify for you moments in the life of David that, that maybe even if you grew up in church, you've never heard preached about. Today, I'm going to be in a familiar passage of Scripture in, in 1 Samuel 17, verses 20 through 29. It's the story of Goliath, and don't let familiarity breed contempt, okay? I'm just preparing you. Don't walk away. Don't blank out. I'm not going to talk about when he fought Goliath. I'm going to talk about the moments leading up to it, the moments leading up to the battle, and what that was like for David. And that's where I'm going to be today. And we've been talking about, remember week one, if you were here, we talked about what it's like to be rejected by your father. To be rejected by your father. There's no other way to look at it for David. David was one of eight sons of Jesse, and when Samuel came to anoint the, the, the next king of Israel, Jesse the father only had seven of his sons prepared in the house to go before Samuel. And Samuel said, is there any other sons you have? And Jesse the father said, yeah, there's one more, but he's the youngest and he's tending sheep. And I told you it bothered me that he wouldn't have all eight boys there. And, and you can make any excuse you want. David's the youngest. He had a job to do. Uh, you know, maybe that's why he was discounted as the next king of Israel, but that's all hogwash, people. He was rejected. He, his father didn't even think he was worthy to be in the house. Give him a shot at least, right? Give the boy a shot. I mean, just like Little League, everybody gets a bat, and, and, and yet he didn't. And yet when, when David walks into the house, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, verses 12 through 13, it says this, God spoke to Samuel and said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so Samuel got up, poured the oil from the horn, and anointed David, and, and in the presence of his brothers, and the next line says, and the Spirit of God came upon him powerfully. Critical part of the story, but, but let's talk about that one line today. In the presence of his brothers. I, um, I, there's moments, right, you want to celebrate in the presence of your family, right? I mean, we, we all come from families, and, and I don't know, I mean, it would be interesting today to find out how big your families are. I mean, I know there's members of this church who have mem uh, families as big as 12 and 13 siblings. I can't even imagine what that would be like. How did you ever eat, right? How, how did you ever, where did, is, did you ever have any clothes you bought, or were they all hand-me-downs, right? I mean, I mean, when you grow up in a family at large, some of us come from from, from families of twos and threes and fours. I mean, the average American family is 2.5, right? I mean, that's how many children you have. I wish I had a half a kid. But anyways, the reality is, is, is most of us have this family dynamic. And he was anointed the next king of Israel in the presence of his brothers. Most people slip right by that. We're like, okay, that makes sense. His brothers were there and he was brought in. No, no, catch the moment, right? Remember what I told you? His father has seven sons who, who, he, who he has bathed, they, they, they comb their hair, they put on their best outfit, they line up in front of Samuel the prophet, they walk by one after another, and Samuel says, no, this is not the next king of Israel. Next, no, this is not the king of, next king of Israel. Next, he does this, and, and, and then finally David is invited in fr from the fields, covered in dust, all dirty, he's been, he's been shepherding all day, he arrives, and this is the one. And in the presence of his brother, the little guy gets called to be the next king of Israel. Now, now you need to understand there, there, is, there is historical record, according to uh, rabbinical priest, and according to Hebrew culture and lore, that one of the reasons why David may not have been invited to be among uh, the showing on that day was because David was a late birth for the family. Samuel, or Jesse, and his wife had seven boys, and it is believed, according to rabbinical culture and history, that there might have been as much as 10 to 12 years between the seventh born Shamar and then the, born, the birth of David. So David is late to the dinner, right? I mean, he's 10 or 12 years younger than the rest of the clan. But by the time Shamar is 10 years old, the seventh born son, 
All the boys are working in the, in, in the fields. All the boys are tending the flock. All the boys are taking care of the cattle. All the boys are buying, selling, and trading. The boys are advancing in their military careers with King Saul. This is all happening, and then David comes along. He's, he's late to the punch, and, and I wonder how many of us this morning know what that's like, right? You are the baby, right? You are the, you're the last born in your family, and you know that you were not expected, right? How, how many, you know that, right? Am I the only one? Uh, okay, on my, on my birth certificate, no lie, on my birth certificate, my name is recorded John, initial J with a period, Clark. And I asked my mom one day, I said, so is my middle name just the initial J? And my mom said, well, we weren't expecting you, so we really didn't have a name for you, a middle name, and we thought we'd get back to it at some point. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think about I'm coming? Didn't you know I was, you were pregnant? I mean, I mean, was I that much of an afterthought? I don't even have a middle name, man. I got just the initial J. That's it. And whenever I fill out like official paperwork for people, like, no, no, you need to write out your full middle name. No, that's it. It's just the letter J. That's all I got, okay? <laughs> My parents didn't love me, right? I mean, I mean, any way you look at it. When, and in birth order is interesting, right? How many of you this morning are the eldest born in your family? Raise your hand. Be, be proud. Okay. Okay. Put it down. See, now we knew the eldest born because you were noted by one characteristic. You're a leader. You're also arrogant, loud, and obnoxious, but we didn't bring that up, right? <laughs> We didn't bring that up, right? But that's not, how many of you are the middle-born? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, middle-born, you are known as followers, right? Forgotten, right? I mean, when you're the middle child, it, 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 there's the firstborn that, 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 that gets all the beatings and, and, and the little one that gets all the blessings and the middle people, you get nothing, right? How many of you are the baby, the last-born, the babies? Okay, look at how many babies we got. Praise God for us. Known as precious, right? Beautiful, necessary, perfect, right? That's us as babies, right? I mean, that's what we are. Birth order, right? I mean, birth order, one of those things, birth order always seems to be funny because, because then there's some of that sibling rivalry, right? I mean, David was anointed in the presence of his brothers. And, and, and you would think this was a high holy day, right? I mean, in the family of Jesse, we got a king. We got a king. And, and, and yet they don't do that. David's brothers do not embrace him as the next king of Israel. As a matter of fact, scripture records over and over again where there was animosity, where there was tension among the family. As a matter of fact, Psalm uh, 69, and let me just say this first. Uh, most of our struggles, our greatest struggles often happen and begin at home, right? Most of our greatest struggles begin at home. It's, it's in that tension. In Psalm 69, verse 8, it's an interesting verse. The Bible says this. This is David recording later in his life, and he said, I am a foreigner in my own family, I am a stranger to my own mother's children, meaning his brothers. David would later lament in life and say, I don't know that I quite fit in. I'm a, I'm a foreigner in my own family. Can you imagine addressing your life in hindsight and saying, I was a foreigner. It was as though I'd come from another country and I spoke a different language. And some of you this morning identify with that, right? I mean, in your own family dynamic, you know that you feel like a foreigner. It doesn't make any sense. You, you know you look a lot like the rest of the siblings, but, but you're a foreigner. You were, you were kind of on the outskirts looking in. He said, I'm a stranger to my own brothers. To my own brothers, I'm a stranger, as though, as though they don't even recognize me, they don't respect me. In, in Psalm 40, Psalm 70, and Psalm 72, David records also word after word about the fact that he felt not only rejected by his father, Jesse, but rejected by his brothers. And, and, and you know, when you try to figure that out, you're like, wow. How hard is that to grow up in that existence and be rejected by not only your father, but be rejected by your brothers, and you're the baby, and yet you've been anointed to be the next king of Israel. Nobody wants to embrace you. Nobody brags about you. It isn't as though the, the, the guests come to the house and the older brothers introduce David, their baby brother, as the next king of Israel. They don't even acknowledge it. As a matter of fact, Psalm 118 says this, that, that it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. This is David talking. It is better to trust in the, or take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. He said, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. You will find over and over again in David's life, as it records in the Psalms, that among his brothers, he felt pushed back. He felt like he was pushed back. He felt like he was pushed out of the way. He felt like he didn't have any value and any significance. It, it's... Um, it's amazing within our families how um, our siblings, right, they know all the family secrets. Uh, Mom, Dad, if you have young ones right now, be ye prepared for the one day when you will hear stories 
that will blow your mind and you'll wonder why the cops weren't called while you were absent because things will happen. Because I know what happens as a parent, right? I did. I got four kids. I got four children. Now their age is about 14 to 24. And, 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 and this happened. One of those moments, it happened just last year, setting on our deck around a fire, having just a good time with the family. I'm enjoying the relationship with my kids and we're talking. And, and my son had just gotten married, my oldest boy. And, and, and his wife was telling stories about when they were younger and her sister and her brother and how they were doing bad things when mom and dad were gone at work. And I laughed and I said, Nicole, I said, that's great. I said, what's amazing about our kids was I don't know that any of that ever happened. <laughs> so you're already ahead of me, right? To which them little uh, children of mine decided to begin telling story after story after story after story of horrific things. And I said, what in the world were you thinking? Andrew, my oldest, said, Dad, Dad, we all remember when you yelled at us the one day. Because Mom and I went out to dinner, and we came home, and as soon as we got to the door, all four kids were waiting at the door with all their complaints against their siblings. Right? He smacked me, he bit me, he peed on my floor. You know, and he's yelling, and, and I'm pushing him back. And I explained to him. I yelled at him at the, on the landing in the front door. I remember I said, listen, when Mom and Dad go out for the night, and we leave you here alone, when we come home, unless somebody died or there's dismemberment, all you tell me is, Dad, it was fine. We had a good time. No problems. That's what I want to hear. And Andrew goes, and that's what we told you every time you went out. <laughs> and I thought to myself, they're right, right? I mean, I would come home and I'd go, hey, how was it? And like, oh, awesome, great. No, at the bonfire pit at my house a year ago, I heard that my son Jared ran away from home, packed his bag, got all of his stuff together, and then left, left the house. And I said, did you guys go after him? And, and Andrew goes, no, we knew he'd get hungry in about an hour, so we just let him go. <laughs> and so Jared said, I said, you ran away from the house? He goes, yeah, twice in one day. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I came back, and when I wanted a sandwich, they, they put peanut butter on me, and then they kicked me out of the house, so I ran away again the second time. What was funny about Jared was he said he took the phone from the house, you know, like, like, like the, house, the house phone. He took it with him so he could call somebody. But he got about 100 yards down the road and it didn't work because he didn't realize the transmitter was at the house, but he's trying to call us to ask us to come get him. Uh, I, I heard about them going at the second story in my window, doing the Rapunzel thing, tying sheets together, and they're going out and then sending the little one out too. And the little one was like four years old. No, climb down there, you'll be fine. There's concrete at the bottom of a two-story thing. What are these kids thinking? I heard about fires. I heard about broken glass. I heard about missing things. I heard about chipped teeth later in life. I thought they chipped it at recess. I had no idea it was while I was out to dinner with my wife. Your kids, I'm serious. And listen, don't ever ask what else happened. Don't ever ask what else happened. Because it only amps up, okay? It gets worse. Stuff happens in our families, right? And your siblings know all your stories, right? Your brothers and sisters know everything about you. And if ever they were given a chance to tell their side of the story, whoo, stories they could tell, right? I am hosting my uh, third-born child, my daughter Abigail, is 18 years old, and she graduated from high school. And so we are hosting at our house, her open house, just happened a month or so ago. And I invited about 100 of our closest friends to come to the house and just to celebrate this. And one of the people I did not invite was my brother Gary. But he showed up uninvited, right? And I, it's not that I did invite him. I just forgot about him. But anyway, so, so he comes. He's about four years older than I am. And as a child, he terrorized me, okay? Much of the damage that you see in front of you right now is from him. Emotionally, physically, and socially is his fault, all right? Therapy has helped a lot, but you can't undo damage like this, okay? Anyways, he shows up at my house, and he comes up and sits at my deck uh, at the table. And there was about six of my buddies, guys sitting around the table. And I realized one of the guys didn't know my brother Gary. And I said, hey, I said, this is my brother Gary. And, and, and the guy said to my brother, okay, there's like 50 people on the deck. All these friends are over celebrating my daughter's graduation. My brother Gary is introduced to a friend of mine. And the friend says to my brother, he said, he said so what was it like growing up with, with John? To which Gary's response should have been, I am so proud of him, okay? That is the standard line, right? I am so proud of him. No, first words out of my brother Gary's mouth was, yeah, Johnny peed the bed till he's 14 years old. <laughs> Why would you mention to friends of mine that I wet the bed till I was 14? Now, he's not lying, okay? I mean, I'll confess that was, I had a lot of trauma when I was little, okay? And even in the early teens, but anyways, why would you mention I went to bed till I was 14 to people you've not even met? Why would he do that? 
Isn't it a killer though, right? I mean, our, our siblings could tell stories. And David, David identifies with that, right? In the presence of his brothers, he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Instead of them embracing it and saying, we're so proud of him, they, they, they want to bring up stuff about him. They pushed him back. And he was about to fall, but the Lord helped him up. I wonder how many of you are here this morning, and you know that the only way you survived, and the only way you've gotten to this point this far, was because God helped you. Am I right? The Lord helped you. We ought to give praise to God that he helped us in some of our difficult moments. Let, let's just be real honest this morning. Some of you know that you grew up in a family where, where, where you are the stranger, right? You are the foreigner. I mean, somehow you never fit into the dynamic of your family. It doesn't have anything to do with birth order. You don't even know if you did anything or what you did. You just know that you're a foreigner, right? I mean, when you're around them now as an adult, you realize you don't speak the same language. You... You don't, you don't talk like they do. You don't act like they do. Some of y'all grew up in families where you were neglected by your siblings. They left you out of things. Even today, right? Even today, you know that, that, that your siblings contact each other constantly and often, and you're the one that gets the last piece of information. And often when you get it, it isn't even accurate. It's as though it's an afterthought when they think of you. That, that happens to you. You're, you were neglected as a child, and now you suffer with that neglect from your siblings as an adult. Some of you were, were physically abused by your siblings. I mean, you had an older sibling who would, who would physically beat you up, and you were, you were not allowed to tell mom and dad what had happened. It's the classic story where you slipped and fell while they were gone. And, but it was more than that, right? I mean, you know that there were things that happened within the family dynamic. Some of you were emotionally and even sexually abused by your siblings. And that is so painful to grow up with and know that you are keeping a secret that absolutely destroys you every day of the life. You were pushed back and about to fall. But I'm here to tell you that we serve a good God who if you have not received his help yet for the pain that you dealt with in childhood, you can receive it today. The grace and mercy of Christ and the gospel was all about him coming back for you. The rescue attempt. God sent his very best to save you and to rescue you from all the damage and from all the hurt and from all the pain. And if you've never received that, today's the day to receive it. Just You reach out to him and say, Jesus, I desperately need help. I, I haven't been able to figure out how to deal with life as an adult because of what happened to me in my childhood. Not at the hands of my parents, but the hands of my siblings. So twisted and messed up, right? And So when we grow up with this twistedness, when we grow up with this neglect, when we grow up with this abuse, it is so hard to grapple with. One of the things we don't talk about in church much is growing up in a family where there was what we call spiritual abuse. I mean, we know what physical and emotional and sexual abuse is like, that, but we don't hear about spiritual abuse. When, when you grew up in a family where, where the Word of God was not used as an encouragement, but it was used as a weapon against you, you had, to, you had to measure up to some standard that the church and your family established for you, and you were judged based on what clothes you wore, what friends you had, how you talked, what you listened to, and what you watched. And everything you did that was wrong, spiritually you were abused. You were told that God is not happy with you. God's not pleased with you. God's going God's to get you for that. And when you grow up with spiritual abuse, this, this pressure put upon you to be something or someone that you're not able to be. And so when we grow up in homes where there's this spiritual abuse, God is used as a weapon, not as a reward, not as a blessing. It messes with you, right? I mean, you even wonder today how God views you because of what you learned and what you were told as a child. See, if we're told too young that we don't measure up to God, how does that work out as we get older? And we're trying to relate to God, and yet we're thinking about when we were 11 years old, and we were judged so harshly. And the, God, the word of God was used against us. The church was used against us, right? I mean, I mean there was a standard and, and it really messes with who we are. Again, I say to you, if you were pushed back and about to fall, I'm telling you right now, God is there to help you. It's interesting that David says about to fall. He didn't fall. He was about to fall. That's why I say to you this morning, if you're here this morning, God be praised that we survived. God be praised that we made it. But here, it's just not enough to make it, okay? It's not just enough to make it. God wants to make more out of you than just where you're at right now. God wants to use you. I believe just like God called David to be the next king of Israel, 
God this morning is calling you to be his next king. He's calling you to be his next queen. He's calling you to be the next best mom in the world. He's calling you to be the next best dad. He's calling you to be the next best business owner ever. God is calling you. And he who God calls, God equips. And so I'm here to tell you this morning, we got to stop the lies. we got to let a lot of that stuff go and realize who I am today is who God created me to be. And no matter what damage, what abuse, what neglect, whatever happened in childhood at the hands of my siblings, I am who God called me to be, and I'm proud of it. I'm good with who I am today. For too long, we let that go on. And what I want to do today is, is I, I just want to show you, and I only got a few minutes left, so I want to slip to verse 28 of, of 1 Samuel 17. And, and I want to talk about something interesting because this is important for you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 28 and 29. Verse 28 says that, that when Eliab... David's eldest brother, heard him speaking to the men. He burned with anger at him, and he asked him. Now, this is Eliab, David's oldest brother, asked the baby, David, who's anointed to be the next king of Israel, who's just delivering meat and bread on behalf of his father, and he's supposed to go see how his brothers are doing. His oldest brother says this, Why have you come down here? Now, to be honest, as an advocate for families with dysfunction and sibling rivalry, I want to step in on behalf of David here. Eliab's first question is, why did you come down here? That's not so bad, right? I mean, I mean if, 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 if you were asked by your older brother, why are you here? You could just easily answer it. But he doesn't stop there, right? I mean, look what, look what Eliab does. Eliab says, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? When Eliab does that, I'm a little hot now. I, I think Eliab, the oldest brother, has crossed the line. Now you understand why Eliab... Why Eliab is so hot with David, why he burns with anger. Eliab, by the way, is the general in King Saul's army. Eliab has risen to the highest level a man can rise in Hebrew culture. He's the man below the king. Is it not enough that Eliab is the general in the Israeli army that he has to belittle his baby brother? in front of all these men. If you read the scripture around it, you'll discover all the military forces have gathered. There is a bunch of men around. This is not a private conversation. And so, so what, what Eliab does is he attacks David based on his performance. He says, with whom have you less left those few sheep in the wilderness? Listen, as a man, I just tip our, our hands. David's job is a shepherd right now at 16 years old. That's his job performance, right? I mean, and his older brother in front of witnesses is criticizing his work. And as a man, one of the things that, that we hold very dear to us and one of the things that qualify us in our minds and one of the things that we, we uphold to people is what we do for a living, okay? And so when Eliab says, with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's implying that David has dropped the ball in his job. He's saying, in the wilderness, meaning that, that they're left run, to run wild. And we know, according to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20, that David actually left the sheep in the care of a shepherd. David took care of his job, and he's running an errand for his dad, and yet his brother's criticizing him, knocking him down at where he works. It's like one of your siblings showing up at where you work at and mock the job you do in front of all your other co-workers. But it doesn't stop there, right? I mean, man, when, when, if I overheard this, if I was standing in the, in the background and I overheard Eliab say this about David's job performance, I would have thought, okay, maybe there's something personal. Maybe, maybe they were at, at edge this morning before they left the house. But then he's, then he's dirty, okay? It's brutal what Eliab does next. Eliab says, I know how conceited you are. Okay, now that's personal, right? I mean, I mean you know with your siblings... That, that one, of your, one of your siblings is arrogant, right? Don't look at them right now if they're here. Don't look at them. But you know you got that one who's a little, a little conceited, a little arrogant. It might be mama's boy, right? I mean, I mean they always did everything right. That, that's personal, that, that Eliab would say that. But, but then, I, but, but then I'm, I'm bothered by what happens next because the next thing that Eliab says is he says, I know how wicked your heart is. See, now that's private, Okay, that's private, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff we don't talk about in public. I know how wicked your heart is. You know, you know it's interesting that Eliab, being the eldest brother in the Hebrew culture, when Samuel showed up to pick the next king of Israel, do you know who the obvious choice was? Do you know who the obvious choice was? It was Eliab. The oldest boy in the Hebrew culture always gets that highest position. Eliab 
thought to himself that he should be king. But his baby brother, who's nothing more than a shepherd, gets anointed to be the next king of Israel. This is why he's hot. And I don't mind that he picked on his job performance. And it doesn't bother me as much that he got personal about how conceited he is. But he's talking about something very private. He said, I know how wicked your heart is. Eliab, I'm sure, in the family that day when Samuel anointed David to be the next king of Israel, and David got up, I'm sure that Samuel said, said to Jesse the father, you must be so proud because God has been searching for a man after his own heart, and he's picked David. Eliab standing in the background, angry that day, knowing that I should be the next king of Israel, says to himself, if you even knew how wicked David's heart is, It's private, right? I mean, you, you don't bring that stuff up. You don't, you don't say that in public settings. But Eliab says it right here. He says, I know how wicked you are. It's a direct attack against God's call and God's choice. One of the toughest things that we grapple with as adult siblings, children, when we have brothers and sisters, is that when God starts doing something special in us, when God calls you to something special, God, God calls you, God, God saves you, some of us grew up in homes where, where they were rough and they were, they were tough homes. And you're the only believer in the family, right? You're the only Christian. You're, uh, out of all your brothers and sisters, you're the only one who, who goes to church regularly and serves Christ with all your heart. It's amazing how, how, how hurtful it can be when a sibling will criticize you for your relationship with God, right? You've been there. Oh, here comes preacher boy, right? I mean, oh, here comes Bible thumper. Oh, I, this, this, is my, this is my sister. She goes to church every Sunday. Be careful. She'll pray for you. The criticism, right? I mean, I mean they're mocking you. And that's private, right? Our relationship with Christ is, is an intimate and private thing. David's a man after God's own heart. It's private. It's intimate. It's, it's emotional. And, and yet, where's Eliab poking at? He's saying to him publicly in front of everybody, I know how wicked your heart is. And then he finally says to him about his position, he said, you came down only to watch the battle. It's as though he's saying, hey, David, let's be honest, buddy. I'm the general, Eliab is saying this, and you're nothing but an errand boy for our father. Why don't you scoot to the background? We got work here to do. This is what the men do around here. And little boys like you, why don't you just move to the background and get in the bleachers and watch? We're, we're on the field. You're, you're part of the fan base. And how cutting it would be for David. Man, if I was there, I'd want to walk up and punch Eliab in the mouth. I'd, I'd want to push him myself and say, hey, pick on somebody your own size. He's only doing what his father asked him to do. And yet here publicly he's criticized. What's interesting, do you notice? Look at David's only response to his brother. Now what have I done, he asked. Can I even speak? And then I got a little insight into David's character and his integrity on that, on that response alone. David does not rebuttal his brother's claims. He doesn't clarify for the witnesses that I've got a shepherd caring for my sheep and, and they're not in the wilderness. David, David doesn't stand up and go, yeah, I, I, I can be a little loud at times. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm arrogant. I, I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. I mean, I mean I'm pretty skilled. David, David, could, David could defend his conceit. He could talk about the wickedness of his heart and say, don't we all have sins? Don't we all have a little wickedness in our heart? Come on, guys. I mean, you know, you know we're all alike. David could have easily defended it. But all he says to his brothers is, now what have I done? Which leads me to believe that David and his brother, this is not the first time they've had this kind of exchange, right? Now what have I done? Clearly, clearly, his brother has been berating him for a while because now what have I done? Come on, dude. Seriously, we're, we're going to do this again. Now what have I done? Can I ever do anything right? That's what David's saying. And he said, can I even speak? I mean, that's all I'm doing here, Eliab. I'm just asking what will happen. And, and who's this guy standing in the valley down below? And why isn't somebody doing something about him? And you guys might as well come this morning. See, when David showed up on this day, he was coming to deliver uh, bread and cheese on behalf of his father, and he was checking to see how his brothers were doing. That's why David came this day. David wasn't coming to this valley of Elah to, to fight Goliath. He didn't even know there was a guy named Goliath. He just simply was doing as his father had requested. See, what David 
new and you and I got to walk away with today is you got to know why you're here. You got to know why you're where you're at today. Why am I here? You don't have to figure out why you were born in the family you were born in. You don't have to figure out why you have the siblings you have, why you're the outcast, why you're the one who's neglected. You don't have to figure any of that out. There's really a need for us to just let that go under the blood of Christ. Forgive your siblings for what they've said and what they've done. You just got to know why you're here right now. Because see, for David, when he was anointed to be the next king of Israel, I believe he began to understand that God was going to do something special in his life. Sure, the end goal was to be king, but there was something else. David didn't know this day when he came to the valley that there would be a giant standing down below hurling insults. But there is now. Clearly, there's a man who is defying the armies of God, and he's just down in the valley. Do you know why you're here? David thought it was to deliver something, but today it's to deliver the children of Israel from a pestilence. Sure, the man's a giant, but that's what God calls me to do. I'll do it. David knew that he was called by God. God himself, the creator of the universe, called David. You get Are you following me? God himself called David to be the next king of Israel. David cannot be who his brother wants him to be. In this moment, David cannot be just a shepherd boy, and he can no longer be a delivery boy. In this moment, he cannot be who Eliab wants him to be. David's got to be who God called him to be. And I guess on this day, David's going to become a warrior. Maybe it's time for us to accept the fact that God has called you, and you're not just a mama, and you're not just a daddy. You're not just a business owner. You're not just a single adult. You're not just a teenager. But you are who God called you to be. And you cannot be who others want you to be. You got to be you. You understand that you stand out in God's eyes. I mean, he uniquely designed you. You are one of a kind to God. You, my friend, are in a class all by yourself. Your brother, you are not. Your sister, you are not. Your mama, you are not. Your daddy, you are not. You are who God called you to be. And no matter what has happened, no matter what's been said over you, no matter what you've been through, you are here today. And God is calling you to something higher and bigger and better than you've ever imagined. I don't know what your giant is. I don't know where you thought you were going to today, but you're here now and clearly God has another plan for your life. Then I say to you, we step out. You know what David did? The Bible tells us he walked away from his brother. He just turned and walked away. Maybe that's what you got to do is start learning how to walk away. Stop trying to answer the critics in your life because all they got is criticism. You want to know why they stab you in the back? Because they can't face you. Because you are special. You got something nobody else has. You got to know who you are and why you are here. You got to know who you are. I am chosen. I am significant. I am equipped. I am positioned. And I am prepared. It does not matter what the enemy says. It does not matter what a sibling says. What matters is what God says about me. I'm good with who I am. Are you good with who you are? Are you good with who God's called you to be? There's got to come a point when we rise up and say, I'm good with me. This is, this, I'm good with me. I know I ain't perfect, but I'm good with me. And I can't be who you want me to be. I just got to be me. David turns and he walks down in that valley. And you know how the story ends. He defeats the giant. Today, my friends, we are going to kill a giant because one of the obstacles we're going to need to overcome as we move forward is this issue of rejection among our siblings. Learn from David. Walk away. Why are you trying to answer? Why are you trying to get involved in an argument again? You ain't never gotten them to, gotten them to accept you before. Why are you trying to love them? Love them. They're family, right? You got to see them at Thanksgiving. 
You got to probably buy him a gift at Christmas and it won't be good enough. So what? You just be who God called you to be. I got to be me and I got to be good with who I am because I know my God called me to more than what I'm just doing here today. And he called you to rise this morning. God be praised. All the glory to his name. Our God reigns and he reigns in you today. And he would you lead us? Would you stand? joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.